To explain why we want to go there is Deputy Project Scientist Katie Stack Morgan. Welcome, Katie. Thanks, Marina. Glad to be here. Now, Perseverance is landing on Mars at the Jezero Crater. Why is it that you and the team chose this particular area? Yeah, so scientists believe Jezero Crater is one of the best places on Mars and possibly the entire solar system to look for signs of ancient life. Jezero contained an ancient lake and has within it one of the best preserved ancient delta deposits in the, on the surface of Mars. And deltas form when a river enters a relatively open body of water, like an impact crater, and deposits the sediment that it's carrying into the lake. And we know based on studies of deltas and lakes here on Earth that they're great places to concentrate and preserve organics and, and support microbial life. We're also excited because Jethro uh, exposes rocks that um, are between three and a half to more than four billion years old and represent a variety of different geological processes. Now, this might be a tough choice, but what do you think would be the most rewarding scientific discovery that we expect to get from this mission? As hands down, I think the most re re rewarding discovery I think we can make with Perseverance would be finding a truly compelling ancient biosignature on Mars. The rocks in and around Jezero Crater record a period of time when life first arose in the solar system. And we have the opportunity with Perseverance to study the evolution of the planet from a once habitable world likely capable of supporting ancient life to the cold, barren planet we know Mars is today. And why do you think, Katie, it's so important to find out if there really is or was ancient life on Mars? Well, the question of whether there's life beyond Earth is one of the most fundamental and essential questions we can ask. And our ability to ask this question and develop the scientific investigations and technology to answer it is one of the things that make us as a species so unique. And based on everything we know about Mars in the past, it absolutely should have been capable of supporting ancient life. So we can find out an answer to the question, where there were habitable environments, was there life? And studying the possible emergence of life on ancient Mars can also help us better understand the conditions that led to life on our own planet that's so fascinating, Katie. Now we're going to take a question from a student, Vara. Hi, I'm Vara, and my question is, why was Mars able to sustain lakes and rivers ages ago, but cannot now? Isn't it cold enough to make water, and isn't it always? Thank you. Yeah, that is such a great question. Um, and one of the things that protects our atmosphere here on Earth and allows liquid water to be stable on our own planet is the fact that we have a magnetic field protecting that atmosphere. We think that Mars lost its magnetic field way back year, billions of years ago and left the atmosphere exposed to things like solar winds and cosmic rays that basically blew that atmosphere away. And once that happened, liquid water wasn't stable on the surface of Mars anymore. It was too cold and, there, and, and the pressure was too low. And so now M Mars is not capable of supporting liquid water and, and likely not capable of supporting life at its surface. Well, thank you so much to Vara for that great question. And a big shout out to all the kids that are watching out there today. And thank you so much to you, Katie, for joining us. That was so great. Thank you. Now sending it back over to you, Raquel. Thanks, Marina. Earlier, we were able to catch up with the communications systems engineer, Chloe Sackier. She helps us break down the system used to track perseverance during landing. The communications infrastructure supporting Perseverance's landing is quite complex. We've rallied a truly global network of relay and communications assets to help us capture and record those precious minutes of entry, descent, and landing, or EDL. We receive a stream of engineering telemetry via these communication assets that helps us see and understand exactly what's happening. Perseverance sends direct-to-Earth X-band tones, each of which provides us with indications of critical entry, descent, and landing events. During entry, descent, and landing, we have two Mars orbiters listening for the ultra-high frequency, or UHF, signals from Perseverance. These orbiters relay these signals to deep space network stations on Earth, Madrid in Spain, and Goldstone in California. The Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, or MRO, has reconfigured its software to perform a type of relay called bent pipe. This will provide us with near real-time telemetry during entry, descent, and landing. We have coverage from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter from just before entry to a few minutes after landing. The telemetry we receive will be delayed by the time it takes light to travel from Mars to us back on Earth. 
Additionally, the Mars Atmosphere and Volatile Evolution spacecraft, or MAVEN, is recording these UHF signals and will be relaying that recording hours after landing. MAVEN will be covering us from around the time of cruise stage separation until a few minutes after landing. We also receive what we call heartbeat tones, which are indications that the spacecraft is alive and progressing throughout entry, descent, and landing. It's important to note that while unexpected, we could lose our communication links and still land safely. Because Perseverance is doing entry, descent, and landing completely autonomously, she doesn't need our help to joystick the landing. The communication links give us added visibility. And you can see Chloe hard at work inside Mission Control right now. Perseverance's landing might look like the system the Curiosity rover used back in 2012. But landing on Mars is difficult. There's always a risk involved. Here's what needs to happen for Perseverance to touch down safely in Jezero Crater. Nothing can be taken for granted when you get to Mars. There's a lot of things we just don't know. Space always has a way of throwing us curveballs and surprising us. I mean, until we get the data that says we're on the ground safely, I'm going to be worried that we're not going to make it. Entry, descent, and landing is often referred to as the seven minutes of terror because it takes about seven minutes to get from the top of the atmosphere of Mars to the ground safely. The spacecraft has to do all of this by itself. There are many things that have to go right to get Perseverance onto the ground safely. There's a lot counting on this. This is the first leg of our sample return relay race. There's a lot of work on the line. Starting about 10 minutes before atmosphere entry, we get rid of really the spacecraft part of, of the rover that's been supporting us. We come screaming in to the Martian atmosphere at 12 to 13,000 miles per hour. And the heat shield is what dissipates all that initial energy through friction. The vehicle will continue actually flying itself through the atmosphere. It's sort of like a transforming vehicle that went from a spacecraft and now it's kind of like an aircraft actively guiding itself. When we're going slow enough, we deploy a parachute. It's the biggest supersonic parachute we've ever sent to another planet. It's critical for slowing down the vehicle. Perseverance's entry, descent, and landing borrows heavily from that of Curiosity. But fundamentally, Perseverance is a different rover. She's bigger, she has different instruments. We've added a lot of smarts on the inside to make it more capable so that it can deal with the landing site that we've given. The science team identified Jezero Crater as basically an ancient lake bed and one of the most promising places to look for evidence of ancient microbial life and to collect samples for future return to Earth. Uh, the problem is it's a much more hazardous place to land. When you look at Jezero, all you see is danger. How do we go to a site that we never thought was safe enough to go to before? So the heat shield, which has protected us all the way through entry, is no longer necessary. We need to get that off so that we can actually see the ground. And we can see the ground in a couple different ways. Perseverance will be the first mission to use terrain relative navigation. So while it's descending on the parachute, it will actually be taking images of the surface of Mars and determining where to go based on what it sees. This is finally like landing with your eyes open. But having this new technology really allows Perseverance to land in much more challenging terrain than Curiosity or any previous Mars mission could. Amongst the rocks and the craters and the cliffs, these things are hazardous to the rover, but these are the things that are interesting to the scientists. Once Perseverance has figured out where she is, jettison the back shell and parachute and light up our rockets. Those rockets help us steer to a safe landing spot that's nearby. That descent stage takes us all the way down to about 20 meters off the ground. That's when we start the sky. Once the rover has hit the ground, the descent stage will cut loose from the rover and fly away to a safe distance. But surviving that seven minutes is really just the beginning for Perseverance. Its job, right, being the first leg of sample return to go look for those signs of past life on Mars. All that can't start until we get Perseverance safely to the ground. And then that's when the real mission begins.
With us now is Al Chen. He is Perseverance's entry, descent, and landing lead. Al, you were part of the Curiosity rover landing. Does it get any easier the second time around? It absolutely does not, especially when considering we're trying to land the biggest, heaviest, and most complex rover we've ever built at the most dangerous landing site we've ever attempted. Jezero may look great and you know promising from a science perspective, but it's absolutely treacherous for landing. There's a cliff, fo cliff wall that's about 200 feet tall that runs right through the middle of the landing site. There are craters full of sand that even if we landed them, we would not be able to drive out of. And there are rocks to the east and actually all over the place, rock fields. Uh, that would be a bad day for us if we were to land on them. Now, Al, what new technology makes this type of land dangerous landing possible? Perseverance is carrying two new technologies that are really kind of under the hood smarts that are allowing us to land at this kind of treacherous landing site. Uh, the first is range trigger. Uh, that's the ability, we've given Perseverance the ability to decide for herself based on where she is, when to deploy the parachute. Previously, we used to deploy parachutes, that supersonic parachute, based just on navigated velocity. But now Perseverance has the smarts to figure out where she is and deploy that parachute at just the right place to make sure that uh, we shrink where we could come down. That actually reduces the area, that error ellipse, the, where we can come down on the ground, uh, from something that was on the order of 15 miles long by 12 miles wide for Curiosity uh, to about 5 miles long by 4 miles wide uh, for Perseverance. So that's quite a bit of reduction. Second, uh, the next piece of technology that's helping us land there is terrain relative navigation. Um, in the past, after we've popped off the heat shield, we've taken pictures of the ground as it's been coming up, but we haven't really done anything with them. This time, Perseverance is carrying uh, a camera to take pictures, but also a kind of second brain uh, to help it figure out what those pictures are telling it and match it up with an onboard map from a satellite. Uh, that allows it to figure out exactly where she is. Uh, suddenly then, she can, she can then fly to safe spots that are nearby once she really knows where she is. It allows the site to not have to be as flat and boring as a pancake as if some of our past sites had been, the entire area we could come down. Now we just need little pieces of that site to be small enough and safe enough uh, for us to land in safely and fly there after we've, dis after we've gotten rid of the parachute. And we also have a social media question coming in. San Sakari 14 on Instagram is asking, how does the sky crane decide where to move itself after the payload lands? After the payload lands, after the rover touches down, uh, the, the sky crane, the descent stage, which is that rocket-powered jetpack above it, the first job, of course, is to make sure you don't hurt the rover. So it'll turn forward or backward uh, so that the engine plumes don't pass over the rover. So it'll come up and start to turn. And it'll go in whichever direction is closest to north. So it can either go forward, if that's the way north is, or go toward the rear of the rover, if that's where north is. And it'll fly about a third of a mile or so away. Thanks for talking to us today, Al. Thank you very much. Now, let's head back to Mission Control for an update from SWATI. Hi, Raquel. So, remember that command that we sent at around 11.35 to turn the transmitter off? We are just about to get confirmation that Perseverance has received the command. The command took 11 minutes to go to Perseverance, and then the reply took 11 minutes to get back from Perseverance to the ground, so we should hear uh, any second now that uh, we have officially turned off the transmitter. And after that, we will be about four minutes from the start of entry, descent, and landing mode. At this point, we will transition from the cruise approach mode to entry, descent, and landing. And that means our travel from Earth to Mars is done, and now we just need to get to the surface. So far, things are looking good. Eight. Hello, this is CAD 3, ready to show mis estimated misdistance for OD-132. Copy, EDL phase, we'll come back. Flight A. Go A. Our tracking stations have all confirmed the results of the transmitter drive off and in lock one way. Copy ACE. GDS flight. Flight GDS. At this time, I'd like to disable the alarms before EDL main. So please disable all the alarm files and start a new downlink session. Copy Downlink's that. ECP. Copy that. Proceeding now.
confirmation that we are now officially one way and the transmitter is off. Rover mission has helped shape the other, starting with the landing of the Pathfinder more than 20 years ago, leading up to where we are today with Perseverance. Perseverance Deputy Project Manager Jennifer Trosper has worked on every Mars rover mission, and she joins us now. Uh, Jennifer, how does Perseverance fit into the history of exploring Mars? Thanks, Raquel. It's great to be here. Well, Perseverance is NASA's fifth rover on Mars, and I've had the privilege of working on every one of them. And the very first rover was the Sojourner rover we sent in 1997, and it was the size of a microwave oven. And even at that small size, Sojourner was able to transform the way that we explore Mars from stationary landers to small roving robots that go from place to place, just like a geologist would on Earth. So once we had that roving capability, then we sent our twin rovers Spirit and Opportunity. Spirit and Opportunity were tasked with finding evidence of ancient water on Mars. Now they did. They're great explorers and both of them found ample evidence that water had once existed on the surface of Mars. But we had a question, another question then, was Mars ever habitable if water had been there? And that's when we sent Curiosity. Now Curiosity was a major upgrade to our rover fleet. She's the size of a small car. She uh, landed with the sky crane system instead of airbags. And she also carries along her own sample analytics lab, and she's still operating today. And during her exploration, she has found evidence of a habitable environment in an ancient lake bed on Mars. So now we're sending Perseverance. Perseverance is tasked with answering the question and looking for evidence of ancient microbial life on Mars. And in order to do this, she has to be the smartest and most capable rover we've ever sent. Speaking of Perseverance, can you tell us more about how Perseverance is smarter than its predecessors? Yes, we've made a lot of upgrades to help her along with the surface mission. One of them is for her autonomous traverse capability. When I say autonomous traverse, I mean we tell her where we want her to end up, and she has to figure out the safe and best way to get there. In order to do that, she uses her cameras, algorithms, a computer. So we've given her another computer, we've upgraded the cameras, and we've upgraded the algorithms. Now she drives three times as fast as Curiosity could drive in this autonomous traverse mode. In fact, her average daily distance for driving, about 200 meters, is close to the maximum distance any rover has ever driven in a day on Mars. So she's fast. Another thing that we've done, which is the most significant upgrade that we've made, is the sample caching system itself. Cur Curiosity has a robotic arm, like Perseverance has a robotic arm, but on the end of Perseverance's robotic arm is a coring drill that will go and take rock cores, transfer them into sample tubes and into the rover, where another robotic arm will take those tubes will seal them and store them and eventually drop them on the surface of Mars for future return to Earth. Great, and we also have a social media question about Perseverance. Erica AS on Instagram wants to know what the wheels of the rover are made out of. Great question. Well, you may think we make them out of some material you've never heard of. It turns out they're made of aluminum. Now, Perseverance's wheels are a little thicker than Curiosity's, but they're actually both made out of aluminum. And one more question for you. Can you tell us more about the importance of where you are right now in the building? Yes, I am above, on the second floor, above the cruise mission support area that you've been watching. And this is the surface mission support area. So as soon as Perseverance lands, all commands, all ta all, this, this room will take over. It will become headquarters for operating Perseverance on Mars. Thanks for taking the time to talk to us today, Jennifer. Thank you. Now, we now know Perseverance's place in history. Let's take an up-close look at the rover with Mars 2020 system testbed engineer, Elio Morillo. Thank you, Raquel. I'm standing in front of the Mars 2020 Perseverance scaled model. As you can tell, this vehicle is about the size of a Mini Cooper. These wheels are obviously black here, and they look like rubber, but they're actually fully made of metal. 
These wheels are designed to allow us to climb over obstacles and of course climb over hills and minimize the amount of slipping once we're traversing on the surface of Mars. Here in the front of the rover, we have the sample caching system. And of course, at the very front end of this is the robotic arm, which this entire system is arguably the most complex robotic system we've ever sent outside of Earth. Here at the tip of the arm, we have a turret which contains a suite of instruments along with some drills and coring capabilities that will allow us to do contact science once we get to the surface of Mars. Not only that, this robotic system is equipped to collect samples about the size of a piece of chalk that then eventually will be stored inside of the vehicle and dropped off in a later location so that an eventual mission can go and return these samples to Earth, something we've never done in the past. Here in the front, we have the remote sensing mast. Something of note is that this mechanism is going to be stowed upon the touchdown on the surface of Mars. And one of the first critical activities we do is deploy this mechanism. This mechanism includes several cameras that are going to give us some of the most breathtaking images we've ever taken on Mars. Along with that, we have some lasers as well as a spectrometer. They're going to allow us to do some remote science. Here you see some of these extrusions that are part of a larger weather suite of instruments that will allow us to characterize the local climate around Perseverance. So that's a quick tour of the rover, but I gotta get back to work. So back to you. Perseverance is collecting samples of Martian rock for future return to Earth. We've heard that scientists have been wanting to bring Martian samples back for many generations. And here to talk a little bit about that is NASA's Planetary Science Division Director, Lori Glaze, who joins us now to talk about the role Perseverance will play in NASA's future goals. Welcome, Lori. Hi. Now, as you just heard, we've heard that scientists have been wanting to bring back these Martian samples for a very long time. Why do we need to bring them back? That's really a great, great question. You know, we actually have examples of Mars already here on Earth that came here as meteorites. But we don't know exactly where they came from on Mars, and then they also have had to make the trip from Mars to Earth, and so they got altered during that time, and then during their entry and descent into the Earth's atmosphere, that also changes what those those rocks are like so being able to go to mars and actually collect a sample where we know exactly where it came from and we know uh, we can preserve it and keep it pristine and carry it all the way back here this will be incredibly important to help us answer questions about uh, the geologic history of Mars, uh, understanding how it formed and evolved, and also really important questions about whether or not life actually existed on Mars three and a half billion years ago, and whether that life, if it existed, has been preserved in the surface of Mars. Now, Lori, these sample tubes that Perseverance is going to be collecting, they're the cleanest things ever created on Earth. Tell me a little bit about that. Oh, my goodness. We worked so hard. The team here at JPL is absolutely incredible to assure that those sample tubes are incredibly clean. One of the main goals of this mission is to be able to detect if there's actual life that's preserved, um, ancient life preserved in those rocks, in those samples. And we definitely don't want to be carrying, you know, our own DNA off to Mars and then bring it back here to confuse our, our scientists when they're trying to study those samples. So it, it is an incredibly clean uh, set of uh, equipment that's been sent there, as you said, the cleanest thing we've ever sent into space. Now this is a very complicated campaign. Can you break down for us how it's going to work and if there's any international partners working with us? You are correct. The, the Mars sample return campaign is incredibly complex. In fact, it's probably the most challenging thing we've ever tried to do. Uh, but we're definitely not going to try and do it alone. Uh, we have great partners with the uh, European Space Agency. And the way this campaign is going to work, well, Perseverance is the first step. Chapter one uh, is going to Mars and collecting the samples. Chapter two is going to be 
a sample return lander that we hope to launch in around 26 to 28, 2026 to 2028. And that lander, uh, it'll be an American lander carrying uh, a fetch rover that's provided by European Space Agency. And that little fetch rover will drive out and pick up the samples that Perseverance left on the surface of Mars. And the fetch rover will bring them back and load them into uh, a rocket that we call the Mars Ascent Vehicle, which will be the first ever launch from another planet. Uh, and it will launch those samples into orbit around Mars. In the meantime, the European Space Agency will have an orbiter that's in orbit around Mars that can rendezvous and capture those samples and then bring them back to Earth for, for us to study back here in our amazing laboratories. A lot of firsts, it sounds like, Lori. And another first, how is Perseverance and the Mars Sample Return Mission going to help the future exploration, human exploration of Mars? I'm so glad you asked that. I think we're going to get a lot of great information from Mars Sample Return with, again, being able to land uh, the heaviest payload we've ever landed on Mars will be that sample return lander that's critical to us learning how to land humans on Mars. And then we are definitely going to want to be able to launch the humans back off of Mars so that Mars Ascent Vehicle is going to be critical, that, that first step of the first launch from another planet. So exciting, Lori. And speaking about the Mars generation, we're now going to take a student question for you from Livia. Hi, my name is Livia, and my question is, what made you want to study Mars, and why are you working so hard and willing um, to wait so long for a sample? Thank you. Oh, Olivia, that is such a great question, um, and, and I enjoy Mars just because it can tell us so much about how our solar system formed and evolved. Um, all of the planets can tell us different parts of that story, and Mars is a really key piece of that. And one of the main reasons we're willing to wait so long to get the sample back is that we've got great new scientists that are all about your age and in about... 10 or 15 or 20 years, you'll be the generation that's going to actually get to work with these samples. When, when they come back, you'll be the scientists and engineers that will, will be the, the next generation to, to change how we think about, uh, about Mars and how we think about life in the solar system. That was a great question, Lori. Reach for the stars, future little scientists and engineers. Thank you so much for joining us here today, Lori. It's my pleasure. Thanks. Back to you, Raquel, for another mission update. Thanks, Marina. The cruise team for Perseverance controls the rover on its way to Mars. And moments ago, they handed it over to the landing team. And it looks like team leaders in mission control are about to talk to both teams. So let's listen in. Uh, the CBM change, uh, as I mentioned previously, is to the EDL reserve to a non-coherent row. Activity. Copy flight. EDL phase, go ahead. Okay, I'd like to proceed. Pep talk, I guess, to the team. All right. Uh, you know I'm terrible at pep talks. I think you, my reputation precedes me there. And uh, look, I know this hasn't been easy, right? I'm not even sure we've even been in, all in the same room at the same time. I mean, I'm staring at folks across the uh, across the internet as well. Uh, even now, right? Only yeah. Point check. Okay. Um, I do want to just extend uh, my heartfelt appreciation from the EDL team to the, uh, to the launch cruise team. Uh, you've done everything we've asked for, right? I mean, you've battled anomalies, you've you know, dealt with CEFIs, you've done everything. Uh, you delivered a healthy spacecraft uh, to the place that we want to go. Um, and she's right on target, right? You, you did the last maneuver literally two months ago, right? This is pretty incredible, in my opinion. Um, and she's on with the right information to help us land. You know, doing the parameter update last night, we're, we're ready to roll. You've done everything right. Um, and you've put up with us too, right? You've put up with our eccentricities and uh, the things we like to do in EDL land. So I very much appreciate that. Uh, so uh, you all should sleep in on Friday since uh, I, you know, you guys have earned it. Um, thanks for literally and figuratively putting us in the right position to succeed. And uh, let's land on Mars together. Copy EDL phase. And uh, as flight director, I also would like to thank the whole team, cruise ops, EDL ops, EDL team and the surface ops as well. It's been an amazing journey. I think we all know that. And it's been my honor and pleasure to work with you all side by side. And your tireless efforts and endurance in the face of our challenges has been truly, truly inspiring. So kudos to you. 
mission, would you like to say something? Yeah, just echoing the same words that uh, that Al and Magdi have uh, have mentioned. You guys have overcome great obstacles in the last six and a half months, and it started with an earthquake in this room on launch day at L minus 20 minutes. So I can't be more proud than all of the achievements that you guys have, have uh, pulled off in the last six and a half months. Whatever happens in the next uh, hour and a half, you can be proud of the achievements that you've uh, accomplished so far. I look forward to seeing you on the other side. And I only wish that the rest of our team could be sharing this moment with us. Uh, this is a very unusual event. This room is only as half as full as it would be if we weren't in this pandemic. So missing everybody on the team who's not with us here today. And uh, go EDL. Welcome to the EDL family. <laughs> Godspeed Perseverance. All right, activity. Go ahead and continue the report. Sure thing, Flight. Um, we've since completed the EDL start anchor. Um, as I was mentioning, we changed our CBM row to EDL reserve two-way non-coherent. That row reinforces our CBM windows disabled, keeps our packetization on, it turns off our ranging and switches to the auxiliary oscillator. We have also started our real-time data products and reinforced Medley on. At this time, we... Now, we just heard Perseverance team leaders thank the cruise team for their work in guiding the rover to Mars. Now, did you know the rover name and Mars helicopter name came from students? Well, a couple weeks ago, Marina was able to catch up with them. Thanks, Raquel. Earlier this year, NASA and our partners held a nationwide essay contest to name our Mars rover. Alex Mather, a seventh grader from Springfield, Virginia, submitted the winning essay that was selected by NASA from a field of more than 28,000 entries from K through 12 students in every state in the U.S. Vanessa Rupani's essay for Ingenuity was so compelling, NASA thought it would be a perfect name for the history-making helicopter, a technology demonstration carried aboard the Perseverance rover. Alex and Vanessa join us now. Welcome you guys. Hello space nerds. Hi. <laughs> now you got to go to Florida and watch the launch live back in July. Alex, what were you feeling as you saw that rocket launch into the sky? I read a lot of books written by astronauts and every single one of them always talks about the raw power behind the space launch and I definitely feel like watching the launch invoked that sense of of well inspiration mixed with anticipation along with that rumble in my chest that's very inspirational and I'm sure that you have had many conversations with your classmates since this all began now, what kind of questions have they asked you I got some people asking me about what this helicopter is, what this rover is, what are they actually going to do? So I love that this whole experience sparked a greater interest in the mission in my community. Why do you think it's so important for kids to be inspired by space exploration? Because space is the future, and kids are the future. Learning about space and watching the story of humanity spread to the stars happen is watching the future happen and seeing history unfold. The best way to keep our home safe and protect our planet is to learn from the worlds around it. So I think it's really important for the next generation of scientists to be engaged in that type of exploration to make our home the best place it can be. Now, speaking of the future, what has your life been like since naming the rover and helicopter? Has it sparked any future aspirations for the two of you? Oh man, I am currently applying to a science and technology school for high school. I'm hoping for a NASA internship sometime along the way, with my ultimate goal being to join the incredible team of scientists and engineers who are about to make this happen. This whole experience has definitely shown me that I want to go into the space industry. I came home from Florida, did all my college applications, and checked aerospace engineering on all the boxes. I mean, the whole time we were there, I was thinking, why would anyone want to do anything else? So true, and the best of luck to both of you. Thank you so much for joining us here today, Alex and Vanessa. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much, I had a great time.
Now your essays, as well as the top 155 finalist essays, are riding on the Perseverance rover, along with nearly 11 million of the names from all over the world that were submitted before launch. And if you miss the chance to get your name on Perseverance, then you will get another chance to reserve a spot on the next mission to Mars. So make sure that you sign up now at mars.nasa.gov for your boarding pass. As virtual celebrations are happening all over the globe, let's take a look at some of your submissions on our social channels, showing us how you're celebrating the Perseverance landing right now. And remember to hashtag Countdown to Mars and send those in. We would love to show them off. Look at these kids. They are getting so excited. Everyone's watching it. A lot of classrooms are watching it. Oh, and great, someone did a Lego version of Perseverance, which is awesome. It looks fantastic. We love getting all your pictures out there. We've gotten a lot of artwork from kids, which has been great. I know I have a nine-year-old John at home, and he loves to draw the rover. And look at that. That is awesome. That's better than anything I could bake, that's for sure. Perseverance in a cake. That looks so great. Delicious. I want to get into that. Another great send in from David Bowie Real. Thank you so much for your submissions. Remember, hashtag Countdown to Mars. We love to see how you're celebrating. Now, you might know our next guest from shows like Emily's Wonder Lab. Joining me now is Emily Kellandrelli. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Hi. Thanks so much for having me. Now, you are very passionate about getting kids interested in science and space exploration. Why do you think kids are so excited about space? Well, I know the reason I'm excited about space, and I think it's the same reason that many others are excited about space, and it's that the people in the space industry work to answer two of the biggest questions that humans have ever asked. Are we alone in the universe, and where did we all come from? And by sending a rover to Mars, we are gaining evidence for the answers to these questions, more evidence than we ever had before, and I, I think that's so exciting. It is, and I know you get loads of interesting questions from kids. Have you gotten any about Mars specifically? Oh my gosh, yes. Everybody loves Mars. It's in movies and books and TV shows and everybody loves Mars. So one of the things that I, I get asked a lot is that, you know, it's called the red planet. Why is it red? Well, it's red because it's literally rusty. The top layer of soil on Mars has iron oxide in it or rust and rust has that brownish red color. So it's, it's red because it's rusty. And also because it's red, they ask, is it red hot? Is it really hot on Mars? And well, no, actually, it's colder than the Earth. It's farther away from the sun. So as you would imagine, it's a little bit colder than the Earth. It also has a really thin atmosphere. So the heat that it does have, it has a hard time keeping in. Um, and so it's a little bit colder. But then I also get asked, what would I weigh on Mars? That's a really fun question. So on Mars, it's a little bit smaller than the Earth. So the gravity there is weaker. It's about three eighths the gravity that we have here on Earth. So if you weighed 100 pounds here on Earth, you weigh 38 pounds on Mars or 100 kilograms here on Earth, 38 kilograms on Mars. Those are all super fun. I think even some adults want to know the answers to those questions, Emily. <laughs> now, why do you yeah. think it's so important to educate kids about science and give them that great foundation? Well, science is the language of nature and learning about science and learning how to think like a scientist means you are learning how to systematically seek out truth in the world. You are learning the scientific method. You're learning how to be a critical thinker. And honestly, those skills are great for whatever you end up wanting to do in life. True. If you want to be a scientist or an opera singer, that holds true. And what are you most excited about today? I mean, humans are launching a robot to Mars. That doesn't happen every day. I think in all of the hecticness that is going on today and all of the nerves, I just hope everyone can take a moment to sit back and remember that we live in a time when humans have the ability to send a robot to another planet. And that is just, that's so cool to me. It is very cool, Emily. Take a deep breath. Thanks for joining us here. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Sending it back to you now, Raquel. Thanks, Marina. We are offering lots of ways to ride along with us to Mars. Now put yourself right into the action now with our Perseverance photo booth. You can pose next to the rover, 
place yourself in our mission control and even see what you might look like taking a selfie on the red planet. There, you'll also have a chance to sign up to send your name to Mars on NASA's next flight to the red planet. It's all available at go.nasa.gov slash Mars 2020 toolkit. And joining us now is JPL Chief Engineer and Landing Veteran Rob Manning. He will be breaking down key moments coming up, and very few people know more about landing on Mars than Rob, going back to the Pathfinder mission in 1997. Thanks for joining us today, Rob. Yeah, thank you very much, Rick, for, for having me here. And it, what a wonderful experience. <clears throat> what a wonderful day for a beautiful day in California. We've, we're just all so excited here, anxious, worried, but very hopeful. Rob, I have a question for you. There is a landing tradition at JPL that involves eating peanuts for good luck. Uh, can you tell us how did that start? Yes, it started in the, in the mid-1960s. What happened was we had a series of missions that had failures. The Ranger program in the early 1960s, <clears throat> one after another, failed. And what happened was one day a fellow by the name of Dick Wallace on, the, on Ranger number 7, on the seventh attempt, decided to bring peanuts to the ops area just before the before the launch, and guess what? That mission worked. Now, we're not supposed to be too superstitious. We're engineers and scientists, after all. But we love tradition, and ever since then, before launch and before critical events like entry, descent, landing, we have brought out peanuts and shared them with the team. And it's been really a, a wonderful little experience, and, and so we're, this is something we uh, will do, we're doing right now, and, uh, and it's something that we, we just can't help ourselves. It's just part of the experience. Oh, well, speaking of the experience, how did the Perseverance team keep the tradition alive this year? Well, this year we passed out little packets of peanuts to the team, and they can sneak a pe one peanut in their mouth for, uh, for as part of the, to keep the tradition alive. But you know, th this is part of the COVID experience. But we can't leave this one uh, undone. So th this is what we're doing, and we're and uh, and, and this is going to help us land safely. All right, thanks, Rob. I have some questions for you a little later on, but we are heading back to Swati Mohan, who is part of the landing team. She'll be calling out key milestone and events as they happen from Mission Control. So let's listen in right now. So right now we're still about 20 minutes from entry, and the EO phase is giving a last-minute um, confirmation of what will be happening in the upcoming uh, changes to the vehicle, just to remind the team. Um, and uh, this will allow us to steer our trajectory uh, as we make our way through the atmosphere. Um, and uh, this is one of the things that allowed uh, MSL, the Curiosity rover, um, to, uh, um, to land where it did. Um, and we're depending on the same type of entry guidance uh, this time around uh, to help get us very close to our target. Uh, as we make our way uh, through entry, finish the uh, finish our, our guided entry um, profile, uh, we'll do a maneuver called uh, heading alignment where we uh, point toward the target uh, and get ready to uh, deploy the parachute. Uh, but th before we deploy the parachute, uh, we need to get rid of a uh, set of balance masses uh, that have been uh, giving us a uh, center of gravity or CG offset um, throughout uh, the guided entry phase. Uh, so these are called the, uh, the entry balance masses. We also call this maneuver um, SUFR, S-U-F-R, or straighten up and fly right. Uh, so we'll go ahead and eject those masses uh, when we get uh, a trigger from the GNC system uh, telling us that we're at the appropriate range to the target to do so. As soon as we deploy those, uh, we will uh, no longer have a CG offset um, and uh, we'll be ready to deploy the uh, parachute 17 seconds later. where the Perseverance team is sitting now. What's in store for them as we approach landing? I'm going to hold here for uh, EO prep as uh, we're about to start that anchor. Copy, piece two. And activity, please call that out when it's ready. Copy, Flip. Let me see the announcement now. Okay. Let me see the announcement, but...
All right. Now, Rob, uh, you've been right where the Perseverance team is sitting now. Uh, what's in store for them as we approach landing? Well, this is the really, uh, this is the nail-biting time. Um, fortunately, we still have ones and zeros coming, but very soon, as we approach true stage separation, the the transmitter on this rover that's been we've been using all the way to get to Mars is going to be turned off. <coughs> um, so we're, we, but, and, and we will lose our ability to see ones and zeros. But the good thing is once the cruise stage is gone, there's another radio that will continue transmitting uh, a tone so that, like, a, like a flashlight that will allow us to see, at least see that the vehicle is still on. And that, and the, and that color of that flashlight tells us a little bit what, what state this, the rover's in. But soon after that, um, it won't be very long before we'll be able to hear more ones and zeros coming from the spacecraft. Um, so this is a really exciting time, and, and it's just important to remind, remind people this is a, uh, there's a lot that can go wrong in a day like today. There's, there are thousands of things that have to go right. Yeah, uh, we had success in the past landing on Mars. You'd think it gets easier, but it really doesn't. Why is it still so difficult? Well, it's, <clears throat> well because it's involved thousands and thousands of things, hundreds of thousands of lines of code. We, there, there is, uh, there's 79 pyrotechnic devices. Each have to work perfectly one critical wire short or one key thing mechanism that doesn't work or breaks and it's mission over and so it's you know and and, and so and, and it's very easy we're human beings we're not perfect mistakes can be made um we count on each other to to find uh, our own mistakes and we, and we uh, work very hard to to learn from the mistakes of the past um, we've had many failures, half, remind people, roughly half, a little, uh, around half of the missions to Mars over history have failed. Um, and so it's, 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 that could happen today too. Even though we've had a nice, wonderful string of successes in the United States, it's still a, 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 still a bit of a gamble. A gamble that we've, we have hoped that we have, we have erred in the side of luck. And, and, and we've stacked the, deck, dice, the, stacked the deck and uh, uh, loaded the dice to make this thing succeed. Um, but um, if, we do, if we do fail and something bad happens today, I can tell you we're going to learn it. We'll have the data to tell us what happened. We'll know why. We'll figure it out. And, and, and if, if we are allowed, we will pick ourselves up and get us back on the horse. And if Congress and NASA allow, we will try again. As we always do, we will learn from our mistakes. And what are the possible scenarios we could be looking at today? Well, there's uh, things, things like uh, uh, you know, one of the key stressful elements for all of us is parachute inflation. Uh, but just even separating from the cruise stage is, is a pretty major event. Lots of devices have to work properly. Um, certainly, um, the heat shield separation, uh, getting, getting the, the descent engine started, there's no less than, than us. Uh, 16 ent rocket motors that have to work, uh, one to, uh, eight to control during entry, another eight to control it during landing. I, I said, it's a lot of stuff and it all has to work. And guess what? We haven't done this before with this vehicle ever. This is its first attempt to actually land. We, we can't try this on Earth. We can't do, uh, we don't have test pilots to try it out on this planet before the big show. So this vehicle is doing it for the first time. We've done the best testing we can do in bits and pieces. But you know, it's it's as best as we can do, and and uh, but I think our team is up to it. We've this team is the best. It's a diverse, intelligent, amazing group of people, uh, people from all over the world who worked on this, not just here in California, but all over NASA, contributors from aerospace, universities, countries around the world. It is just a, an incredible, remarkable engineering achievement, and I am just so proud of this team. Thanks, Rob. Now let's listen back into mission control. We're about 14 minutes from entry interface. The vehicle is currently preparing the heat rejection system that has kept the thermal system cool inside the air shell for about the last six months. This will allow the spacecraft to more easily cut the line in upcoming cruise stage separation, which is under four minutes now. We have now enabled the rover Pyro bus. That's the pyrotechnic uh, system um, that, that was that's gonna powering off the cruise stage devices. That, and, the, and these are the de these are the things in the cruise stage that will that we no longer need. With the pyrotechnic system working, we can you can we can explode the devices. The vehicle is preparing for the upcoming cruise stage operation in about three minutes fifteen seconds. 
by powering off all the devices on the cruise stage in order that they can be safe once the cruise stage is jettisoned. Yeah, this is a this is a this cruise stage has been very reliable. We are firing our first pyros to vent the HRS liquid and gas. Ah, this has been the coolant that's we kept our vehicle from getting too hot in the way to Mars. We have to vent it into space. And this, so this is one of the first uh, major events that take place as part of entry descent landing. Uh, the HRS vent anchor is complete. Yes. We will see the next anchor in approximately three minutes. Okay. We are currently 12 and a half minutes from entry interface. We are coming upon cruise stage separation in two minutes and 20 seconds. What's happening now, Rob? Okay, well, ju we're just waiting. The, 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 the rover is completely in charge. It's doing all the things we've taught it how to do. It's all built into the software. We've tested it over and over and over again. This team has spent 24 hours a day, seven days a week, testing this thing for years. And, and, and so this is, uh, this is really the culmination of all that work. So this vehicle is, is, gonna, is getting ready to push that cruise stage away. Uh, once it gets pushed away, um, it, 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 the entry system with the rover inside, with the rover still in charge, is going to get ready to, to uh, take the vehicle, turn it to the right orientation, and aim it to Mars, and, and, uh, and prepare for entering the atmosphere. This won't be long. Um, be prepared for this event. Take We're about a minute and a half from mistake separation. About 11 minutes, 20 seconds from entry interface. Okay, so it's about 10 minutes from cruise separation until entering the top of the atmosphere. From then on and out, things happen fast. We are switching fast. to MFS K-Tones. Telemetry will have stopped. Telecom is confirming that the spacecraft has switched to broadcasting tones. These tones are received directly from Perseverance, but have very limited information content. We won't receive real-time information until about um, t nine, ten minutes from now, once the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter starts relaying information from Perseverance. We are under a minute from cruise stage separation, about ten and a half minutes from entry interface. It's getting exciting. I have to admit, I am quite anxious, uh, but very hopeful that this machine is going to do what we asked it to do. You're seeing the heartbeat tones. Okay, that means that, we've, that there's no more ones and zeros coming, it's just the vehicle telling us it's still alive. We're continuing to receive tones from Perseverance, coming, standing by for cruise stage separation. We have indication that cruise stage separation has been confirmed by the spacecraft. We're off on a good start. In about one minute, Perseverance's landing software will wake up and begin the final preparations for entry. The first action it will do is to fire warm-up pulses with the entry thrusters. These pulses ensure that the spacecraft gets the thrust that it wants during entry interface. We're about nine minutes from entry interface. Okay, so now the vehicle's on its own. It's, gonna, it's turning itself into the direction of facing the heat shield toward Mars, and uh, and will eventually uh, uh, hitting the top of the atmosphere. We're not far away. This is going to go very quickly from here on out. That's confirmation that uh, we got shadowed by the uh, cruise stage uh, as it uh, passed through our beam to the Earth. Telecom indicated actually that we could see a signal that the cruise stage went between the Perseverance entry capsule and Earth. So we saw a little blip uh, in the data stream indicating the cruise stage separation. We have confirmation that the vehicle has started warming up those entry thrusters.
Well, the pulses have begun. At this point, the spacecraft is trying to stop its spin from the cruise two revolutions per minute down to zero, and then we'll turn to its desired orientation from entry. It will se separate the two balance masks that have kept it balanced during all of cruise. This will allow the entry capsule to have lift when it enters the atmosphere. We have confirmation that the aircraft has turned to the desired entry attitude. We are about seven and a half minutes from entry interface. Okay, the vehicle is pointed in the right direction. The thrusters are warmed up and doing their job. And now we've, we've spun down from the two revolutions per minute that the vehicle had the whole way to, uh, the way to Mars. It was a spin-stabilized spacecraft. And then from here on out, it's going to just be a bullet and it's going to control its orienta orientation and attitude via rockets on the back of the back points shell. carrier lock. Uh, sorry, and we're uh, e DTE from uh, Radio Science from uh, Green Bank reports carrier lock. You see the carrier on the downlink. Flight level one. We are continuing to wait for entry interface. We're about six minutes and 45 seconds from entry interface. We have confirmation from uh, Greenback that they are receiving direct to Earth telemetry via that path. The spacecraft Perseverance is currently transmitting heartbeat tones. These tones indicate that Perseverance is operating normally and has nothing significant to report. This is as expected. We're currently just over six minutes from entry interface. Okay, and now we wait. As soon as we get to the top of the atmosphere, the atm uh, it will be very quickly, which is the entry point. It, it won't be very long before the, the, the atmosphere will start getting thicker and thicker. It's going very quickly at a, at a fairly steep angle of 15 degrees uh, into the atmosphere, and as it starts to slow We're down. just under uh, we're about five and a half minutes from entry interface. We're still receiving heartbeat tones. Uh, we expect to continue receiving heartbeat tones until about five minutes after entry. At that time, Perseverance will be no longer in view of our antennas here on Earth. About 90 seconds prior to entry, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter should begin receiving telemetry from Perseverance and streaming it to Earth in near real time. Uh, there are a few expected short outages such as when we have a plasma back out or when we enter the peak heating phase. Aside from these outages caused by the plasma blackout, antenna switching, or high dynamic events, spacecraft events, we should have telemetry until about 90 seconds after landing. Uh, a plasma blackout is when the signal from Perseverance isn't strong enough to make it through the superheated, super fast air flowing around the spacecraft all the way down to Earth. Once the temperature drops below that peak heating, we do reacquire the signal from Perseverance. We are currently about four and a half minutes from entry interface. Perseverance continues to report heartbeat tones, indicating everything is nominal. Okay, now, what, we wait, what we're looking for now is we're, uh, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter should be in view soon of our vehicle and be able to listen to ones and zeros coming from a separate radio that's really designed to talk between spacecraft. It, Camera it, reports the electro radio is powered on, ready to receive signals from the lander. Okay. MRO is ready and, list, and able and waiting for the, to hear from our rover. Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter has reported that it's ready to receive the signals from Perseverance. It should be in a few minutes here. We're just Flight a local one. from entry interface. We don't need these ones and zeros, as Swati said, um, but to land safely. But we we really need it for our own uh, health and well-being today to keep our nerves in control. But Around this time, a second spacecraft, Maven, should begin picking up telemetry from Perseverance, and will continue to record that telemetry until several minutes post-landing. 
We won't get that data for several hours after landing as it's being recorded and then will be forwarded to Earth later. We are continuing to receive heartbeat tones, indicating that everything is nominal. We're currently at about three minutes until entry interface. Okay. Very soon we'll be getting ones and zeros, I hope, from our radio on the rover. The entry interface is nothing more than just an arbitrary place in the sky that we've defined to be above the atmosphere. But, th but from that point on, uh, there's definitely uh, atmosphere, and above it, there isn't. We are two minutes from entry interface. Perseverance will transmit heartbeat tones, indicating everything is nominal. So the tones can tell us whether something is bad or not is happening. So, so far, the heartbeat is, is doing well. So the vehicle thinks it's help. It's uh, in good shape to land, which is a great sign. Uh, We're just under two minutes from entry interface. As it gets closer to Mars, Perseverance is actually being pulled in by gravity and accelerating. By the time Perseverance reaches entry interface point, she should be going just under 5.4 kilometers per second. We're at about 90 seconds from entry interface and standing by for Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter to pick up the telemetry. We are one minute from entry interface. MROs are in receive mode. We have confirmation that the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter is now relaying data from Perseverance. We're about 30 seconds from entry interface. Perseverance is going about 5.2 kilometers per second and is about 190 kilometers altitude above the surface of Mars. Confirm your jet data flow. About seconds from entry interface. 5.3 kilometers per second and an altitude of uh, 150 kilometers from the surface of Mars. Confirmation of entry interface. Perseverance is currently going 5.3 kilometers per second at an altitude of about 120 kilometers from the surface of Mars. The subject is now waiting until it begins feeling the atmosphere of Mars to slow it down. Once there is enough atmosphere, it will start controlling its path to the landing target. Navigation is also confirming that we can see a little bit of that slowdown of the atmosphere on the Perseverance entry capsule. Our current velocity is about 5.36 kilometers per second and an altitude of about 67 kilometers from the surface. We are probably seeing MRO plasma blackout at this point. The vehicle should be doing its turns right now. MRO has lost lock. Perseverance. 
We have indications that Perseverance is now performing bank reversals in the atmosphere. These are the steps in order to control its distance to the landing target. Uh, Perseverance has just passed through the point of maximum deceleration and has indicated that it felt approximately 10 Earth Gs of deceleration. Amaro has lock again. We saw a small outage uh, of the UHF telemetry from Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter during that peak heating phase likely caused by the plasma blackout. Perseverance is still continuing to perform bank reversals in the atmosphere to control its distance to the landing target. Perseverance is going about one kilometers per second at an altitude of about 16 kilometers from the surface of Mars. We have entered heading alignment, which means Perseverance is no longer trying to control the distance to Mars, but in, to the target on Mars, but instead is flying straight to the target. Our current velocity is about 550 meters per second at an altitude of about 15 kilometers from the surface. MRO is reporting good telemetry log. We are coming upon the straighten up. We are starting the straighten up and fly right maneuver where the spacecraft will jettison the entry balance masses in preparation for parachute deploy and to roll over to give the radar a better look at the ground. Yes, yes, yes. The navigation yes. has confirmed that the parachute has deployed and we are seeing significant deceleration in the velocity. Our current velocity is 450 meters per second at an altitude of about 12 kilometers from the surface of Mars. Perseverance has now slowed to subsonic speeds and the heat shield has been separated. This allows both the radar and the cameras to get their first look at the surface. Current velocity is 145 meters per second and an altitude of about 10 kilom nine and a half kilometers above the surface. Yes, yes, yes. Right. Perseverance now has radar lock on the ground. Current velocity is about 100 meters per second, 6.6 yes. kilometers of the surface. Right. Perseverance is continuing to descend on the parachute. We are coming up on the initialization of terrain relative navigation and subsequently the priming of the landing engines. Our current velocity is about 90 meters per second at an altitude of 4.2 kilometers. We have confirmation that the lander vision system has produced a valid solution and part of terrain relative navigation. We have timing of the landing engines. Current velocity is 83 meters per second at about 2.6 kilometers from the surface of Mars. We have confirmation that the back shell has separated. We are currently performing the divert maneuver. Current velocity is about 75 meters per second at an altitude of about a kilometer off the surface of Mars. Gear and safety, Bravo. We have completed our terrain relative navigation. 
Current speed is about 30 meters per second, altitude of about 300 meters off the surface of Mars. We have started our constant velocity accordion, which means we are conducting the sky crane, about to conduct the sky crane maneuver. We've lost direct to Earth tones. As expected. As expected. Sky crane maneuver has started. About 20 meters off the surface. We're getting signals from MRO. UHF is good. Touchdown confirmed. Yes. Perseverance safely on the surface of Mars, ready to begin seeking the sands of past life. At this point, the descent stage has flown away to a safe distance. Perseverance is continuing to transmit direct through Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter to Earth. They're still getting telemetry from the lander. Oh. Oh. All right, all stations. Uh, we got it. Touchdown, We're, We're going to wait for the images. I, I, uh, wow. This is so exciting. Uh, the team is beside themselves. It's, oh, it's, it's so surreal. Stay tuned. We might get some pictures. Be great. Riding on this. Yeah. yeah, we just heard the news that Perseverance is alive on the surface of Mars. Yeah. It's not, uh, not the flight. flight. We have seen the completion of EDL 3000. Copy activity. That is as expected. Emerald is still seeing a strong signal from the lander. We have just heard the news that Perseverance is alive on the surface of Mars. Congratulations to the mission. And Looks like we have some more news in. It looks like we're getting the first image. Here, take a look at the first image. Flight, this is OL3. I have uh, the target point on the map when you are ready. We are ready, OL3. Go for it. Flight, I'll be uh, moving in, showing you the safe zone that we've landed in. The team has just put the first image from Perseverance on the surface of Mars. Now, it comes from the engineering cameras, known as the hazard camera. Uh, this camera is mainly used to help the rover drive safely around Mars, and we will get higher resolution photos later in the day. Look at that, right? You get the same. Nice. This is 
Steve. Stand by for Steve. You did. You did. It. You did. You led the team. You made it happen. We just got our second image in. Our second image is in. Okay, this, these, these, we have a camera in the front and out rear of the, of the, of the spacecraft. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, they're near the ground, so these are pretty close. So you can see the wheels there. Uh, and, 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 the, and they're a little dirty because we've got uh, glass covers over these, these cameras. But uh, we took these seconds after landing, so, so there's still dust in the air from our landing event. Uh, so this is, this is happening. Um, uh, you know, this happened just seconds ago, just arrived. And uh, this is really amazing. And, and uh, we even know where we landed. Uh, this is the most amazing thing. The vehicle has told us where, where it's landed because it knew, figured it out. You know, this is a sign. NASA works. NASA works. And when we put our arms together and our hands together and our brains together, we can succeed. This is what NASA does. This is what we can do as a country on all of the problems we, we have. We need to work together to do these kinds of things and make success happen. Joining us now is the acting administrator of NASA, Steve Jurisic. Steve, welcome and congratulations. Hey, thank you. What an amazing day. It, how does it feel to have another rover on Mars? Uh, it, it's amazing um, uh, to have perseverance, joy, and curiosity on Mars. And what a, what a just a credit to the team. I mean, just what an amazing team. Um, to work through all the adversity um, that goes and all the challenges that go with landing a rover on Mars, plus the challenges of COVID and, um, and just an amazing accomplishment. And what does this mean for NASA and its future plans? So for robotic exploration, you know, every time we um, execute a mission with new instruments, we discover new things and things we never thought we would discover. So that's, that always informs our future robotic missions, uh, both landers, rovers, and orbiters. Um, this mission also has technology on it. One of the cool things is the Ingenuity helicopter. Um, it's, a, it's an experiment on this mission. But if it's successful, we can use it as an observation, science observation platform by putting instruments on it, and also use it as a scout um, for future rover missions. And, uh, and then just the entry, set, and landing um, capability. Um, it'll allow us to land more and more larger, more ambitious robots on the surface of Mars. And then for human exploration, um, we have the MEDLI, Med, uh, Mars Entry Set and Landing Instrumentation, which is going to give us EDL information. Um, we have the Mars Environmental Dynamics Analyzer. It's going to give us uh, properties, size and properties of dust particles, because when, when we send people, we're going to have to deal with that dust. Um, and uh, just, it's just, this is just an incredible mission because of the science and the technology, and then caching samples for a Mars sample return mission. That will be a, an amazing mission, the first round trip to Mars and back, and bringing those samples cached by Perseverance back to Earth to examine with state-of-the-art um, equipment in our laboratories here on Earth. We have so much to look forward to. And we also have a student question coming in from Landon. Let's take a look. Hi, my name is Landon Applegate. I'm in sixth grade and I'm going to Academy for Academic Excellence. And my question is, do you think we could get resources from Mars to help on future missions or even as like a launching point? Great question, Landon. Actually, we have an experiment called the, Mox the Mars Oxygen In-Situ Resource Utilization Experiment, or MOXIE, 
and it's going to gem demonstrate generating oxygen from atmospheric CO2, and that could help gener uh, develop, you know, uh, generate breathable oxygen and even, if we can liquefy it, oxidizer for propulsion systems. So that's a tech demo on Perseverance. And then we're going to continue to characterize the frozen water on and below the surface of Mars and eventually try to figure out how to extract that water from the Martian soil or what we call regolith. And then we can use that for potable water and also break it down into oxygen and hydrogen for rocket fuel. So absolutely, we're going to try to eventually figure out how to live off the land to support human missions to Mars. Thanks for taking the time to talk to us today, Steve. Thank you. And now that Perseverance has safely touched down on Mars, let's learn more about what's in store for the rover. Joining us now is Surface Mission Manager Jessica Samuels. Jessica, your surface operations team has now taken over. What are they doing now? Yes, hi Raquel. We are so excited here in the surface mission, mission support area. Uh, the team will do a handover with the entry, descent, and landing team and uh, uh, pass any critical information. And then this team behind us will be the team that does the health and safety assessments daily as we progress on this mission. And what do the upcoming weeks look like for your team? So as we enter Mars time now, uh, the commanding team will be working overnight while the rover is asleep so that uh, we can perform the initial checkouts of our key rover functions and our science instruments. And we have to do this all in time for the regularly scheduled communication pass, which happens in the morning. And so we will be working around the clock uh, making sure that uh, Perseverance is healthy and um, we will begin this exciting adventure. Ed, can you tell me what's it like living on Mars time? It's, uh, it's a little bit like constantly, uh, you know, flying and changing your time zone. Uh, the rover, um, you know, on Earth, the rover wakes up at the same time every day, but on Earth that's 40 minutes later. So the team is going to be shifting our work schedule by 40 minutes as we come into work over the next few weeks. So it, it, it'll, be, uh, it'll be exciting and, uh, and some, uh, some late, oh, late nights, but, uh, but we're also excited and uh, we uh, can't wait. It's a whole new lifestyle. Yes. We also have a student question for you. This is Sophia's video. Hi, my name is Sophia Lopez, and my question for NASA is, how is Perseverance going to survive? And here's a drawing that I made from Perseverance thinking about Earth. Thank you. Well, Sophia, Perseverance survives um, with a power source um, that charges its batteries uh, overnight while it sleeps, and it keeps heaters uh, on so that all of our critical electronics can stay warm, um, as well as our mechanism. But it's really uh, survived by the team um, that performs the health and safety assessments every day and communicates with the rover um, and makes sure that uh, she's, she's doing okay. Well, thanks for your time, Jessica, and good luck living on Mars time. Thank you. Should be fun. <laughs> <laughs> Let's head back to Marina as she gives us a sneak peek into the future at JPL. Thanks so much, Raquel. It's definitely bustling behind me. Uh, it is not quiet like it was just 20 minutes ago. And congrats to the whole team. What an amazing accomplishment. Mike Watkins is the director of NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. He was the mission manager during the Curiosity rover landing on Mars. Welcome, Mike. Oh, thanks. Glad to, glad to be here. You can see all my mask markings here. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you were just celebrating, and rightly so. Now, you've been around for a number of Mars landings. What makes this one special? Well, you know, two things. I mean, it's the biggest and best rover we've ever sent to Mars, um, and, and it can really, you know, do amazing things in terms of, uh, you know, its own scientific exploration of this habitable environment, you know, at Jezero. Um, but, you know, it's also, as, as, as you've heard today, you know, it's the first step in Mars sample return. So really, you know, it's, it's not only doing its own mission, it's setting us up for a series of missions and to bring those samples back. And, you know, a lot of the effort to develop the rover uh, was specifically designed, you know, for that sampling and caching system. It's one of the most complex robotic systems ever made.
And uh, you know, having it down safely means marsh sample return continues right on course, and and uh, and and we are moving forward. Wonderful. Now, JPL has a long history with robotic space exploration. Why do you think it's so important to continue to push those boundaries? You, you know, there's a lot of reasons. I mean, obviously, it, you know, for, for places that are far away, like Mars, and even farther away, uh, you know, like Europa, uh, right now, robots are the, robotic exploration is the only way we can uh, make those scientific discoveries and really understand these early uh, habitable environments. In the case of Europa, maybe it's even still habitable. And, uh, you know, we're not ready to, to, to go there with astronauts yet, uh, but the robots are ready to go there. And so we always, uh, you know, are forerunners and pathfinders uh, of, of, of human exploration. And we start by sending, you know, our eyes and, and arms there in the form of a robot. And um, it is just fantastic to be able to do that and to learn from each rover, learn from the science and the engineering and make the next one better and make more and more discoveries. And every time we do one of these missions, we make fabulous discoveries. And, uh, and you know, each one is, is more exciting uh, than the last. The future does look exciting. Now, as director of JPL, what would you like to say to those teams right now celebrating? Oh, you know, obviously they, they have earned it. Let me, let me tell you, I mean, they... Uh, have worked, you know, for years and years on this mission. And then in the past year, of course, we had the COVID experience. And, and you know, I want to thank not only the team, but also, you know, all of JPL. You know, a lot of folks had to had to, uh, had to uh, pitch in here, you know, in terms of making sure our remote telework, you know, our, our IT systems were good enough to, to support folks working from home. You know, all of the folks looking at, uh, at PPE and our safe distancing and reconfiguring facilities uh, to make them safe uh, for the employees. Um, it's just an um, incredible amount of work by the entire lab and, of course, especially by this team. And, uh, you know, and, and in one sense, you know, the, the seven minutes of terror are very exciting. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, the mission's just started, right? We, we built the mission, you know, not to land, but actually to drive and get the samples and do other uh, technology, um, you know, demonstrations. And so, you know, for m much of the team, you know, uh, this part of the mission's over. But, but for most of the team, the mission's really just starting. And so, uh, you know, I think they're very excited. But, uh, you know, everybody, I think, can take a big uh, a deep breath and a sigh of relief uh, now that we are safely down on the surface. Yes, that collective sigh of relief. And I hear a lot of excitement and celebration behind me as well. So thanks so much for joining me, Mike. It's my pleasure. And thanks to everyone for joining us, too. Congrats again to the Mars 2020 Perseverance team for a successful landing. Back to you, Raquel. Now, there will be a flight test coming up for the Ingenuity Mars helicopter. And if this technology experiment is successful, it would mark the first time we have taken a power-controlled flight on another planet. Sometimes you have to do something just to show that you can do it. When the Wright brothers flew for the first time, they flew an experimental aircraft. And in the same way, the Mars helicopter is designed to show that we can fly power helicopter flight in the Martian atmosphere. From day one, this was the unwavering dream of our team, to get our helicopter launched to Mars so that we can get the opportunity to do the very first rotorcraft flight test in the actual environment of Mars. It's extremely difficult to fly at Mars because the atmosphere is so thin. Compared to Earth, at Mars is less than 1%. So the first and foremost challenge is to make a vehicle that's light enough to be lifted. And then the second is to generate lift. The rotor system has just been very fast. 2,000, 2,200, 2,400. 2600. We're spinning between uh, 2,000 and 3,000 revolutions per minute, and it takes a lot of energy. So it's that balance of a very light system, yet having enough energy that's needed to you know, spin the rotor so fast to lift, and on top of it, having to design in the autonomy. It has to be fully autonomous from the time it takes off to the time it lands. What we do do on the ground is we plan the flights, and so we determine from here where we want the helicopter to go. Our experiment window is 30 Martian days. So we have planned uh, up to five flights of incremental difficulty. The very first flight, the main thing is we want to get the legs off the ground. And so we will basically go up uh, about three meters and we'll hover there. Uh, and then we'll come down again. And that will be the first, you know, really major milestone. Most of our flights will be at the three to five meter height. 
we will be going horizontally again at a few meters per second probably go out you know 50 70 meters and come back in successive flights we'll probably push that further try to go further so our priority will be to get back engineering telemetry and not so much images but i'm sure we'll return a few you know because they'll always look cool at this point we've tested all we can on earth we have mathematical models that shows how it will fly at Mars, and we've tested it in the simulated environment that we can create on Earth. It really is time now to do the real flight test at Mars. Nothing is a given, but we have done everything we can in terms of a test program here on Earth. The vehicle is performing extremely well so far. It's been doing exactly the right thing, even right now, when it's bolted onto the Perseverance rover. So there's a very good chance that we'll pull it off, yes. But it's still high risk. And none of us forget that you could have a glitch that, you know, could mean end of mission, yes. It's going to be exciting, reacting to any surprises we have. We can't wait. <laughs> What's really most important is everything we're learning here is for the future rotorcraft systems that we want to introduce into space exploration. Mimi Ong is the project manager for Ingenuity. She joins us now as they await a chance to check out their helicopter in the coming days. Welcome, Mimi. Thank you, Marina. Oh my goodness, we've been talking about this for months, Mimi. Did you ever think you'd be here at this point? I mean, what's going on in your head right now? This is super exciting. You know, we have been working on Mars helicopter for over six years testing and carefully designing it for operation at Mars. So what's going through my mind? Ingenuity Mars helicopter is finally at the destination that it is designed for. Now that Ingenuity is on Mars, what is the timeline you hope to accomplish as you move forward? We have a series of major milestones between now and Ingenuity's first flight. So tomorrow we'll turn on the helicopter and its space station could confirm health after experiencing the dynamics through the EDL just now. And the next major milestone will be when the rover deploys the helicopter to the surface. And that marks the first moment that Ingenuity operates on its own in a standalone manner. And surviving that first cold frigid night of Mars will be a major milestone. We'll execute a series of checkouts and then we will perform that very important first flight. And if the first flight is successful, we have up to four more flights in the 30 Martian days that we have set aside for our flight experiments. And that's when you finally can breathe, right, Mimi? Yes. <laughs> now, why is it so important to have that aerial dimension to space exploration? A helicopter flying far ahead of rovers and astronauts in the future can provide high definition re reconnaissance information for the rovers and the astronauts before they take the long journeys. And as importantly, being able to fly will enable us to get to places that we cannot get to with rovers and astronauts, like sites of steep cliffs, deep inside crevices, areas of high scientific interest. It will be game changing. Game changing is right. And we've talked about this a lot. You've mentioned the risk is huge, Mimi, but the reward is high. What will be your greatest reward? You know, our team started with the question of whether a helicopter can fly at Mars, given the extremely thin environment. And we systematically demonstrated a series of technical steps. We demonstrated lift first, and then we demonstrated lift and the first ever powered control rotorcraft flight in simulated Mars atmospheric density. And then we went on to build the full up helicopter that can not only fly, but operate and survive autonomously at Mars, all under 1.8 kilograms, about four pounds. And each of these major milestones have been a first. And the success at each of these has been so rewarding. And along the way, the rewards just kept coming. And I have to tell you, at this moment, it's going up exponentially. <laughs> so after all these tests, analysis, simulations, and more tests on Earth, our team now gets a chance to test, prove, and learn how it works in the actual environment of Mars. Our team can't ask for a bigger reward than that. Oh, Mimi, I'm so happy for you and your team. And now we're gonna take a question from social media on Instagram for you. 
At Not Vibhuti asks, is the helicopter going to be doing science? Well, the helicopter ingenuity is a technology demonstration. And we are, well, we are demonstrating the ability to fly and learning how to fly for the very, very first time. And so this is a technology demonstration and a pathfinder for future larger rotorcraft, future missions that will carry much larger instruments. So on this mission, we're not doing any science. We're concentrating on engineering uh, data. How did the vehicle perform? And as you saw uh, Bob Bellram uh, in the video before, we will be taking a few color pictures, first ever color pictures uh, from uh, the flying aer aerial vantage point, but they'll be icing on the cake. For this one, this is all about engineering data and how do we fly compared to all our tests we have done on Earth. Mimi, so much for your team and the future generations of scientists and engineers to look forward to. Thank you. Thank you so Great much day. for joining us, Mimi, and good luck to your team with that first test flight. Thank you so much. Now, we look forward to the Perseverance rover and Ingenuity helicopter beginning their journeys on Mars as their adventures are just about to start. Go Perseverance and go Ingenuity. Back to you, Raquel. Thanks, Marina. Landing on Mars is never easy, but this team has persevered and NASA's fifth rover is on the red planet. You can still hear them buzzing in the back right now. And to get the latest updates on Perseverance as it explores Mars, follow at NASA Persevere on Facebook and Twitter. I'd like to thank everyone watching for joining us today. And to the students and teachers tuning in, we hope you learned a lot from today's landing. And thank you for all your questions. We have a news briefing coming up at 2.30 p.m. Pacific time. That briefing will wrap up the day and include reactions from Perseverance team members. We'll leave you now with some of the landing celebration photos you've shared with us, set to Youngblood's cover of David Bowie's Life on Mars. I'm Raquel Villanueva. Thanks for watching. It's a